Hi, I'm Tessa Carver. I'm at the University of Geneva. I'm here on behalf of my professor, Teresa Monterulli, who, who might know a little bit more about this subject. I'm just a PhD student, but uh, I work a lot with the data and the ice cube analysis, and I had to learn a little bit about how we manage everything for this presentation, so I'll do my best. Uh, so I want to talk about neutrino detectors, how they work as telescopes, how we take in data and that's managed and how we do analyses. And this is from the perspective of the ice cube telescope because this is what uh, I work with. So what is ice cube? Well, we're a neutrino detector based in the South Pole and unfortunately we can't all work in the South Pole. So there's about 300 of us working across the world at 49 different institutions in 12 different countries. Most of these are in the US and Germany, but we also have uh, like Copenhagen and in Switzerland, importantly, and, uh, and Australia, too. And uh, what is the ice cube detector? For those of you who uh, aren't familiar, we're a neutrino detector uh, in the ice, and it's a really huge detector. You can compare it to this uh, little picture of the Eiffel Tower. It's a kilometer cubed, and the, the reason we're able to pull that off is because we've just instrumentized the, the Antarctic ice that was already there, and we drilled 86 different holes using hot water and filled it with cords with uh, digital optical modules that they're there to take in, measure any uh, high energy light that comes from within the ice. And these strings are about uh, 100 meters apart, so they're very far apart. We're looking for very, very high energy events. And it's a pretty reliable detector right now. We've been running for about 10 years, and we have uh, over 5,000 optical modules, and so far only 32 of them have failed. So we're pretty happy with how it's working. We're hoping it will keep running for a really long time. So I mentioned before that the ice cube detector is picking up light, but neutrinos are famously neutral, don't interact with electromagnetic waves, so how do we detect them with light? Well, what we detect is actually uh, charged particles that come from neutrino interactions with the uh, ice, the nuclei in the ice, and they come in two different main kinds of events. So when uh, charged muons are produced, they have a fairly long uh, interaction length, and so they're able to really travel across the detector and we end up with a nice track that you can see on the left. And this is really good for, for giving us a direction of the original event. And at these energies, we can say the direction of the muon is approximately the same as the direction of the neutrino. So we can point pretty well to the original direction. However, if we're looking at uh, electrons and taus that come from uh, electron and tau neutrinos, then uh, they have an interaction length that is sort of shorter than the distance between the cords, and, and we end up with this sort of spherical topology uh, that we call cascades. And these, as you can imagine, they, they don't point so well in the direction of the original event. And we have to have quite good timing resolution to have any pointing at all. But because they're largely or sometimes even completely contained in the detector, we can have a pretty good estimation of the energy of the events. Uh, whereas for the track-like events, often if they're through going, th this really increases our effective volume. They don't have to interact in the detector. They can interact outside, but then we only can place a, a, a lower limit on the energy of the neutrino event. Uh, we can sort of estimate with stochastic losses what the overall energy is, but it's nowhere near as reliable. So how do we take these events and really use it to, to map the sky, since you know, we don't have all of these many, many events that you get when you use light? Well, there's two main methods in terms of looking for sources of, of neutrino emitters. And one is to uh, just take only our neutrino events and combine as many of them as possible and look for if uh, lots of them are pointing in the same direction, uh, any sort of clustering in space and or in time. And then another is we expect these neutrinos to be emitted by sources that are also emitting other messengers like gamma or cosmic ray, something like this. So we take information from one of these observatories, telescopes, and we look and see if we find a flare running at the same time in the same position using our ice cube events. So the image I put below is an untriggered analysis, so it means it's only using information from the ice cube telescope and our ice cube events. And it's just trying to map out the sky with our events and look for spatial clustering integrated across the lifetime of the detector. And this using seven years of events, you can see the dark spots are spatial clustering. And unfortunately, up till now, we've not found anything uh, significant. So we don't have any uh, actual point sources in this map. But eventually, I hope that you know, we'll be able to really make a map of the sky with real significant point sources in them. So I've mentioned a little bit about what we're trying to do with the detector and how do we get there in terms of data. 
Well, there's actually lots of different analyses that can be done depending on if you're looking for specific kinds of sources, emitting specific spectra of events, or some analyses are not even looking for point sources, they're just looking for the overall flux of neutrinos. And so they select differently the kind of data they want to use, and one of the, uh, the first selections that really proved that we had a diffuse neutrino astrophysical flux is doing something where it's really looking at the region where you expect to be dominated by your astrophysical signal over the background. And this is at extremely high energies above 50 TeV, and after seven years of data, this only selects about 100 events. Whereas something where you're able to take in more background, for example, if you're looking for clustering and you expect a uniform background, then we can have hundreds of thousands of events with years of data because uh, we want to get those low energy signal events as well. And we do this by filtering at multiple stages, and each stage tends to branch out for the different kinds of uh, data paths that we need to use. And then the final selection is very dependent on the analysis being run. And something that we can take advantage of for IceCube is that neutrinos, they don't interact very much on their journey to Earth. Some of our background is, is atmospheric muons. And so we can really eliminate a lot of our background using the Earth as a natural filter so that anything coming from the northern hemisphere has to pass through the Earth. And so atmospheric muons, they don't tend to survive unless they're really badly reconstructed. So a little bit of information of then what of our data consists of. So firstly, I mentioned that it's constructed of over 5,000 optical modules, and each of these modules is detecting light levels. And uh, they also detect uh, dark noise within the DOM that's coming just from, uh, just dark noise from within each module. And this is happening at about 600 hertz per DOM. And we don't want this to affect our event rate because you can imagine over 5,000 DOM, 600 hertz per DOM, we would end up with a huge event rate. And in order to combat this, we use uh, local coincidence triggers so that we need multiple DOMs from separate different strings to have a uh, light signal over a small time window in order for us to start compiling the event. So then once we have a significant number of DOMs that are all triggering at the same time, all of the signals are sent up to the DOM hubs and they're compiled in a matter of seconds into an event. And these events are stored at level one at the detector on site. There's a big laboratory that I'll show in a photo above, directly above the detector. It stores this information and we end up collecting data at about one terabyte per day, but we're limited by a satellite in terms of sending this information back to where we can process it. We can only send about 100 gigabytes a day. So not all of that information is, is directly sent. There are some filters that are applied, low level filters that are applied straight away and there's some slightly more information can be kept on disk, which is able to be shipped by plane or by boat later, but the data that we really work with most of the time is 100 gigabytes per day. So in terms of the timeline of how it works, we start off with light hitting the detector, look for triggers and local coincidences. This is compiled into events with some low-level filters and then sent to Wisconsin-Madison with the servers and cluster there. Then here, there's a second level of data processing that's run. It's split into very few uh, separate channels. For example, there's high energy channels, which are very, uh, it's important that these run very quickly so that we can use them to tr send alerts to other detectors. There's low energy channels, which are useful, not when you want to use the telescope properties of the detector, but more you want to look at neutrino properties. And then there's, there's other channels for, for other uses. And this is happening all on a very quick level because this is what you need for alerts in this, like, I think less than a day. And finally, uh, you have level three. And this is also, all of these things are done automatically by the system. Level three is also done automatically, but uh, there's a little bit more input from the users in terms of you can request modifications, but this happens at, on a scale of weeks because we have some pretty intensive reconstructions and, and still a high rate of data that are processed here. And then finally, we have the final data, which is very much up to the people who are doing the analysis. So some working groups, they'll have a, uh, people in charge of producing a new data set, and they will spend uh, probably on the scale of months, sometimes a year, in order to figure that out. Sometimes people will take, make their own data set, depending on what they want to use. But this is very uh, dependent on the analysis, and it's done directly by the users. So how do we make sure that all of this runs smoothly? Since, uh, as you can imagine, once it's in the ice, we can't really touch the detector at all. So 
firstly, they worked really hard to make sure that our detector was simple and stable before putting it in there, obviously. And then uh, we have a lot of variables that are constantly being monitored all of the time. And this information is, firstly, if, if there's anything urgent, we can page people who are on site. There's quite a few people there in summer, in winter, not so many. We have always at least two people there, and we call these the winter overs. There's a picture of them there during the crossover. It's so of two old ones and two new ones. And this is the laboratory that we have directly above the detector. And uh, all this monitored information is also displayed on a web page, the i3 Live. And we have shifters responsible every week in terms of checking all of this data and making sure everything seems consistent. And then they report that to uh, weekly into a weekly group. And the experts there are able to take the important information and look into it further, see if there's any problems, if any configuration needs changing. And so here, I put an example of what the page can look like. So what is our data like when you, when you finally want to go to use it? What does it seem like? Well, uh, IceCube is a great detector in terms of it's continuously taking data. People have worked really hard that our lifetime is now greater than 99%. But in order to, to deal with this data, we've divided it into eight hour run periods just for the sake of, of having manageable sections. And uh, this is changed when the data configuration changes because with each run, we have a file that, that says the, the configuration of the data so that we can use that for a simulation. So at the low levels, this is, is also separated into subruns because we still have uh, thousands of events per run. And this works out to be about 2.5 minutes per, per subrun and about 1.2 gigabytes of data. And this is stored in an IceCube specific file type where it's just uh, frames and each frame is an event and they contain all of the different variables that, that we use. It tends to accumulate as you go further down the pipeline because we keep adding new variables with new reconstructions. And then these are stored very simply using the, the channel of the, the data filtering, the, the year and the, the level, the year, the date, and uh, then the run number. So anyone who's looking for a new file, they want to see if, there's any, if it's finished processing yet, it's pretty easy to navigate around the, the system and, and find what you want to use. And yeah, this is just a fun, this is uh, not the data, but this is just at the IceCube lab itself, people just changing the cabling. All right, so then once you have all of your data, how, how do the users go about uh, running their analysis, doing the final processing? Well, we have three different locations at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison where they have a whole IT infrastructure, including storage servers, and they have a data processing cluster. And this, importantly, is uh, where all the simulation is run. So in speaking to people, that's really what our limiting factor is, actually, is, is simulation. And that takes up most of the, the clustering jobs. And we also, in terms of having backups for the data, we've sent backups to a site at Desi Zoiten in Germany and the NERSC. And so this way we, we don't risk losing anything if there's a problem at, at Madison. And the, the simulation is able to be done also on the grid. And this is contributed to by Belgium, Canada, Germany, Sweden, and the US. And this is allocated dynamically depending on what those sites are using. And, and the IceCube users also have access to this as well, but it, most of it goes towards the simulation. And, and all of the IceCube users have direct access to the servers and the cluster uh, at Wisconsin to, in order to run their scripts and save their data. So that was all very much uh, an internal level of how things function, but because we're a telescope, it's important that we work with other experiments. And the way that we do that is we're involved in the Astrophysical Multi-Messenger Observatory Network and we have memorandums of understanding so that we can share relevant information with these, with these telescopes. And this can be a, a specific analysis topic that they want to work together on, and then they'll propose it and, and share all the information and work together. Or it can just be in the form of, of timely alerts so that when we see a particularly interesting event, we can immediately tell another telescope to point there. And uh, this is very important because IceCube uh, is running continuously and it has a full, uh, full sky field of view. So, and, and neutrinos could be one of the first uh, particles to be admitted by, by a, like a, a flaring event or a supernova or something. And so we want to be able to tell other telescopes with a small field of view where to point and where to look and, and see if we can see a correlation. So this is just an example of a GCN alert that was sent out where we would have done a preliminary reconstruction and energy, uh, like direction and energy reconstruction. And these need to be done again, but 
we will have something and, uh, and then we tell the other telescopes look and they report back if they saw anything, if they didn't see anything, whether it was unusual. And so what is the status in neutrino astronomy right now? I've been talking only about IceCube and IceCube has been running for over 10 years. We've been taking data, we're a kilometer cubed experiment in the southern hemisphere in the ice and we're pretty stable, we're hoping to continue for upwards of 20 years from now is the idea. There's another very similar experiment called Antares, which is in the northern hemisphere in the Mediterranean. It's a bit smaller in size, if effectively it has a hundredth of the volume, and, uh, and it's going to end in 2019 to make room for a new upgrade that will be uh, working more efficiently. So what is the future of neutrino astronomy? Uh, well, KM3Net is the upgrade to Antares, and it will then also have a kilometer cubed so that it can, it can start taking data at the rate that, that IceCube does. And so far, they've launched two strings, and they're, they're planning on launching more soon. And uh, it'll be in the Mediterranean, and they show an improve, much improved sensitivity in the southern hemisphere, which is, which is useful because this is where we see a lot of our galactic plane where we expect to see sources. And uh, they're able to get this sensitivity also because they can use the Earth as a filter where we do for the northern hemisphere, they do for the southern hemisphere. And also because of their less isolated uh, location, they'll be sending about 100 times more data to the surface than IceCube does, and it was 1,000 times more than Antares did. So in order to compete a little bit, uh, IceCube is also planning upgrades, but they're nowhere near so close in the future. There's the IceCube update, which is not terribly interesting for, for observatory points. It's, they're adding more uh, strings into the inner core for the lower energy events. But in terms of using the IceCube as a telescope, there's a high energy array where they'll be uh, making the effective volume about 10 times as big. So it's not the green, it's the blue here. And uh, this will be done by roughly doubling the number of strings that we have, so the distance between them will be much further. So we, we won't have all of the same information for some of the low energy events, but what we really want is to see a higher rate of the top energy events, like PEV events, where we know that these are almost certainly astrophysical signals. And, and this will be very useful because once we start seeing about 10 of these a year, there's a good chance that one of these will, will trigger with what we see from another messenger, and, and we can start to get a better picture of what these sources are. So I'm on a cheesy note and say I hope the neutrino astronomy is looking pretty bright in the future. <laughs> Thank you.